<laughs> okay. That's too hard. <laughs> All right. Uh, looking at the Gospel of, of John, uh, really we're, we're going to make a big transition after today. Big transition in John. Uh, but before we, certainly before we do that, what, where have, what are some of the things we've, what, is, what are some of the things we've learned about Jesus in the Gospel of John? He's God's son. Okay, we've learned that he's, that he's God's son. And what does, that, what does that mean in John? Because he's God's son, we saw that in, in Mark. Uh, God's son what meant he was... One with God. Well, he and Mark, it meant he was crucified. That's, that's, that's what it meant, because that's when the centurion said, that's God's son, when he was on the cross. So for, in Mark, God, uh, Jesus' sonship was really pointed at crucifixion, suffering, identification with us. It's a little different in, in John, because we've, already, we've heard a lot about him being God's son in I'm John. Kidding. Yeah, from the very beginning, yeah. So, it's, uh, you, so you talk about it as a oneness with God. Being God's son means that the father and son are one. Okay, what else does that son share? Yes. Well, if you're one with Jesus, then you're one with God. Because... Okay, which, which is interesting that if we're one with Jesus, we're connected yes. to God, so you can be connected to God through Jesus. You talked about in the beginning, so with God's son predates Time. time predates time, and we're going to kind of talk a little tiny bit about that today in in um, in an interesting in an interesting way. Again, something that's harder to see in English than it is in Greek, uh, but is really significant, I think, to understand what Jesus is praying in the seventeenth chapter. So, we'll, but we'll talk about that. So we we've, we've got we've learned that Jesus is God's son. When the father and son are all, all one. Okay, what else have we learned uh, about, about Jesus? That he and, didn't come to judge. Okay, that he didn't come to judge. He came to? Uh, save. Save, yeah. That's, I mean, that's what he says in the third chapter. You know, that's, his purpose wasn't to, to judge the world, but to save, save the world. Right. Okay, so we've learned that. What else? Anything else that you've, we've learned about about Jesus. Well, he was trying, in John, he was trying to show that you didn't have to use idols and sacrifices anymore. Okay, that, that, and, and we got that again right at the beginning. Because when he cleanses the temple, when he uh, throws people out of the temple, and when he uh, creates wine at the wedding in Cana, you know, here, symbolically, I am now replacing all this Jewish worship. All this Jewish worship is now centered on me. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I am the place where you meet God. You because don't meet he is God. Delight. Because he is all good. We've got this whole, this other stuff too. That all Jesus, God. all those images used. Yeah, he is the light. He is the truth. truth. He is the temple. good shepherd. The good he shepherd. Is he is the temple. He is the bread. He is the way. He's the truth. Uh, he's all these things that we can kind of understand and with which we can, we can sort of identify. Yeah, I know you're looking at me. That's, yeah, that's, that's, that's really good. All right, so we are, in, in the 17th chapter, we are in now what? The 18th. Oh. This is the fifth chapter dealing with one event. You know, one event. And what is the, the fifth chapter? What is happening here? The, well, crucifixion is coming. The last supper. Last supper. All of this is dealing with the last supper. You know, remember 13, chapter 13. It started and you're able with the foot washing and the, sh the sharing. And then all of a sudden we got a whole bunch of, what happens after that? After the foot washing and the meal, what does Jesus, Jesus start Judas. doing? Judas. Oh, he starts preparing them for his... Okay, he starts preparing them for life after he's gone. Yeah, after Judas is, is, is gone. And what does he do in those chapters <coughs> that prepare them for life after he he's gone? Okay, that they're going to receive the Holy Spirit okay, he, and that the Spirit will lead them into all truth. Okay, you're gonna, the Spirit's going to come... 
Uh, it's going to be like a paraclete, which is sort of a, a tutor kind of figure. And it's going to lead you into all truth, which is really interesting, since he says earlier, what about truth? He is. That he is the truth. I am the truth. So, And we're going to see that kind of play out in chapter 17 as he prays. So he's giving them some assurances. He's giving them some instruction, all of which are great for the disciples there about life after Jesus is gone. Good for them, really outstanding for us. And why is that why is that so important that it's directed so much of it is outstanding for us? So we can have eternal life. Well, so we can have and he'll talk about that right at the beginning of seventeen. I think he, in in it goes about their struggles and problems right. that they're gonna have, but they if they have faith they'll get through it, it'll be light at the end of the tunnel. Right. And and you know for his disciples as they're standing there or sitting there, or whatever they were doing, and he's teaching them this, they could very well be saying, huh? What's he talking about? Yeah, huh? We're not you know having what? any yeah, struggles. What? Huh? We're not having any struggles. We got you. Right, right. You know, uh, well, that's, thank you, Jesus, for information I don't need uh, right now. Uh, but, but thank you anyway. Uh, it, so for them, if we look at it as a, as a it's sort of a historical way, you know, what he says is nice. It's sort of like as an old teacher. We used to have what's called nice-to-know information. You know, when you're doing a class, teaching a class, and you'd say, oh, this is nice-to-know information. Well, what did that mean? When, it, when a teacher says, oh, this is nice-to-know information, what does it mean? It's not going to be on a test. It's not going to be on a test, which means some kids put their pencils down, others start writing notes, you know. Nice-to-know information. Out. Yeah, yeah, yeah like that's that right. They're on their phone. That's right. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> Uh, but nice to know information is something you probably aren't going to, you don't need because you're not going to be tested on it. This is nice for them. This is nice to know information. They're not facing this yet. They don't even anticipate facing it yet. Although he's given them enough warning, it it's more than nice to know information for the people that are going through it. That are going through it, and for us. And who is it that's going through it? John's, John's audience. You know, so John's, remember, John's gospel is being read to an audience that's going through this. This is really important to them. You know, so it's, that's, the message is for them. And since the message is for them, the message is for us, you know, who come later. Okay, so Jesus has been doing that in some in 13, 14, 15, 16. That's what he's been doing. Okay, now we've got a big shift at the beginning of 17. And we've closed, remember, we've closed this twice. You know, we've seemed to have come to a point where Jesus is saying, okay, boys, let's go. And then he goes on, you know, and we've kind of done, we did that again at the end of 16. And like he's finished, boom, now 17, he, he continues. Uh, what does he start doing at the beginning of 16? Uh, 17. He starts praying. Okay, he starts, he starts praying. In the other ones, he was talking to the disciples. Now he's conversing with God. Now he's conversing with God. And um, one of the things that we've seen in other places where he converses with God is he will say, he will say, or John will say, he really need, didn't need to do it out loud. Uh, he did it so that it would benefit, it would benefit the people around. And so he's done that before. We, we could kind of at least think in the back of the, our mind that maybe that's happening here too. Because Jesus says the Father and I are one, therefore, why would I need to talk why to the Father? Say it out loud. That's, that's right, since the Father and I are one. Know what I think. Exactly. Know what because we're one. Yeah, we're, we're one. So, this is, but so we want to look at what he's saying in this prayer that might be beneficial for us, for us because he's doing it for our benefit. Okay, so we've got, he starts, he starts to, to pray. And how does, how does he begin the prayer? And right at the beginning, verse 1, how does he begin the prayer? Father. He says, okay, he says, Father. And he's talked about Father and Son. Yeah, now the hour has come. What, what does he ask the Father? Glorify him. Okay. Uh, glorify your Son so the glor uh, Son may glorify you. What is it that's about to happen? Okay, he's going to be lifted up what? On the, on the cross. He's going to be lifted up on the cross, which means he's going to be dead. He's going to be dead. He's going to be crucified, right? 
And how is, how is the, his death going to glorify the Father? What, in, what, in what he's already said in these three chapters obedience. that precede it, well, what is going to glorify? Okay, his obedience is going to bring glory to the Father. What else in his death? What is his death going to trigger that wouldn't be triggered if he didn't die? For his salvation. Okay, our salvation. In particular, our salvation through Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Without him going, he's already said that. You know, if I don't go, then the Spirit doesn't come. When I go, the Spirit does come. I'm about to go. You're going to be glorified in this. Okay. So what's going to be the ultimate result in, in this? Okay, he, you're going to get eternal life. Now, it's interesting the way he phrases that eternal life. Um, et, eternal life, he says he's going to do what with eternal life? He has authority. He has authority over it. And therefore, eternal life is something that is, if he has authority over it, if that's something that's his, how does it become ours? Through him. Through him, right? Through him doing what? Being lifted up. Dying. Dying. Well, dying, but with respect to us, we get eternal life because he, if it belongs to him, he gives it, right? And that's what he says. You know, he's, this is something he is, is giving. Now, again, this is tip good John stuff because who is in control? God's God God is always in control. Okay, so eternal life is something that is given, right? Now we don't we don't appreciate it. We don't receive the benefits from it. We don't know really what it is unless we choose to trust that it's been given, right? Which make makes sense. You know, if I if I don't if I don't believe that I've received something. Then, then, you don't it, it. then yeah, it doesn't mean anything because to you're not using yeah, it. Yeah, because I'm not using it, I'm not claiming it. You know, if, if you know, uh, Meg Floyd, I told you about Meg Floyd, what, the girl I stalked when I was a junior high. You know, uh, the fact that I loved her meant nothing to her <laughs> because she failed to claim it, right? You know, so she didn't get the benefits yeah. of, yeah. of me. <laughs> For which I think she is forever thankful. Um, the, so she didn't, because she didn't trust it. She didn't believe it. It didn't matter to her. So if we don't, and there's a logic to this. If we, if we don't appreciate this gift, and if we don't appreciate the one who gave it, then it doesn't mean anything. Especially when you look at how he defines eternal life. How does he, because he says, I'm going to give eternal life, right? And we immediately think, oh, he's talking about life after death. Right? Oh, everybody knows. Eternal life, life after death. When you die, you have eternal life. He says, it's not life. no. Eternal life is knowing God. Eternal life is knowing God. Knowing God when? Now. now. Knowing God now. And, and now, duh, it makes sense. You know, we, we have this gift, but we're not going to know God unless we believe. We believe in the gift. You know, duh. You know, it's not what happens after you die. It happens... What, it happens while you're living. And that becomes the key to eternal life. Uh, at least as presented in John. Now understand, this is how John is defining eternal life. When we look at what Paul writes in his letters, and, and I, if you all are interested, we might want to look at one of his letters next, which would be kind of cool. When you look at what Paul wrote, he doesn't use eternal life to signify this. He uses another word. In Greek, dekaios, and dekaios means righteousness. So when Paul talks about righteousness, relationship with God, that's what righteousness for Paul means. That's what Jesus is talking about here with eternal life. It's the same concept. What they've done is what? Change the word. Change the words. Use different words. Okay. So it's it's not a not a huge deal. Okay. So this, this is eternal life. Now, how is this going to be possible after Jesus is gone? How are they going to know about this eternal life after Jesus is gone? Jesus told them. Spirit. Jesus told them, and he got the Holy Spirit. Spirit that's going to, because we're not going to, Jesus didn't tell us, right? <laughs> Jesus never told me. So the only way I know yeah, about he eternal did tell life. Me. How did he? You told me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, 
uh, Jody, Hagen's grandson, called me Jesus. Oh, he did? Yeah. <laughs> called oh, me Jesus. He? And, and in fact, even, even more than that, Melody, one, one Saturday, she, because she sees clients sometimes here, and it was like in the evening, in the winter in the evening, and I was in my, in my, I had stood up or something, and it was a little dark, and she, when she passed you, she just glanced in, and she said, I thought Jesus was in there, <laughs> uh, and I said, well, I'll tell you something. This is Jesus going to see you. <laughs> you know, this is this is not a good. If I'm, that's not good. <laughs> you should all be going to see because that's how we propagate. The well, very good. Thank you for the for pushing the the, the theology. I, I appreciate that. But but yeah, we have Jesus does. Jesus is communicating. In fact, he's going to talk about that. It's going to be communicated through Holy Spirit. And that's why it's so important that they receive the Spirit by Jesus doing what? What, what did you say? Well, being lifted up. What, it, how do they physically receive the Spirit in John? He, he blows on them, or breathes on them, and they receive the Spirit. That's a whole lot different than the Spirit as an independent you know, agent coming on a crowd gathering. It's in him to begin with. Exactly. Exactly. It's something that he, just like God breathes oh, life to into Adam, he God, Jesus it. breathes the spirit into us. He had to give it. He had to give it. That's right. It, the, source, the source is in He's him. The is in him. Okay. Doesn't mean one is right and the other is wrong. Just means they have, it's Luke just, and John just, have a different. Portrayed. Exactly. Same spirit, same meaning, same uh, importance, just communicated in a different way to make a different point. One that's intensely personal, the other is a powerful independence, powerful independence. Both of which are important when we think about the Holy Spirit. Uh, just so conveyed in two ways. Anyway, so we've got Jesus is going to convey this eternal life through the Spirit, we know, and in, a, in that sense, yeah, Jesus has told us that. Okay, now how is Jesus gonna gonna glorify the Father? Because he's right at the beginning he said completing the work. Okay, he is gonna finish the work he was given to do. Now he's gonna talk about that work in just a little bit, in just a couple of verses. So we don't need to define it now. For what does Jesus ask? To be glorified in his presence. Okay, okay. He asks asks for for glory. And what is what what does he say about himself? What is Jesus? To, that he said he had it before. Had it before. Okay. Before what? Before the world, the world existed. That was, so well, that was kind of confusing me. Right? Oh yeah. Okay. Before the world existed. So what is Jesus saying about himself right here? That he was always. He was always there. Ooh, I'm experiencing deja vu all over again. Did he? Did we hear that in John before? Yeah. Yes. We well, yeah. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. Ah, so and the Word was God. What might, what might the evangelist John be doing in this prayer? If Jesus, what he says right here, is hearkening back to what he said, what John wrote. Jesus didn't say it. John wrote it. What he wrote in chapter 1. What, is, what may John be doing here in this prayer? Especially knowing that we got a major shift at the beginning of chapter 18. After chapter 18, he's bringing it full circle. He's bringing it full circle. So this becomes kind of a, a, a summary of what, of the theology he's presenting, bringing it full circle. Complete version of what he believes. Exactly. The, he is, he's presenting sort of in a nutshell, this is what I, this has been my point through the gospel, the whole, the whole way. And right here we've got him going back to the prelude, and it's not going to be a surprise that when we get into it, a word from that prelude, and I just told you what it was, <laughs> is going to be really important in, in this prayer. Okay, now, according to verse 6, because he, he talked about uh, his work, you know, finishing the work the Father gave him to do, in verse 6, what was the work that glorified the Father? Revealing him. Okay. Revealing him, his his name, his identity, right? And what does and he he to those to whom did he do that? 
to those that he pulled out of the world. Okay, those and and those he's pulled out of the world belong to who? God. Okay, God belong to Jesus. God. God gave them to Jesus. Jesus. And what do they know? And they have obeyed the word. Okay, they mean? they know everything, right? Mm -hmm. You've given me, and how do they know it? Because they, what's that? Because it came, from came from God, right. And what in particular enabled them to understand what was, to know everything? Because the Holy Spirit. Jesus. Well, what, what does it say in verse 8? Because they're the, yours. Okay, Ver, what does it say in verse 8? They accepted it. I gave Ver, them the word. Gave them the word. Okay, they are spe, special part because they have been given the word. The word. Now, Right here, we gotta, we got to pause just a minute because the word is going to be a big deal here. Well, Jesus is the word. Okay, right. That's not the word used here. It's not logos? It's not logos. This is, it will be logos in the rest of the chapter. Here it's not logos. Here it's a word called rema. And rema is, is a Greek word for something that is said. That's, that's what it means. It's something that is said. So it means word. I mean, that's usually how it's translated, word. But it's, it's not logos. Because logos is something that was established at the very beginning, chapter 1. This is a different word. So we want to be real. And, and see, this is another one of those times where in English, we've got two different Greek words that are translated the with the same English word. And, and I think if, if we assume that this word, and it makes sense that it's, that it's something that's said because... It's like knowledge. I've given you yeah, in knowledge. a sense. I, get information. I've given you information. I've spoken to them. And it's the result of what I've said to them. If we take that definition and carry it over into the logos later then it gets really, really confusing. Then we start making assumptions about things like the Bible that are never made. You know, but we, we start doing well, that. The Logos gave us information, which would be the words that he spoke. Yeah, the, the words that he spoke reflect the Logos. Because the Logos... But it is not the Logos. It is not the Logos. The, the, and, and we'll get into that. So if that's confusing to you, that's okay. Because he's going to spend the rest of the chapter talking about logos. He's not going to use Rama again. This is the only time he uses it. Uh, but it's, and, and that's good he uses it because that's how we learn about, the, about him, right? We learn about him because of what's written down. So we listen to what's being shared. The word isn't Jesus. The word is what Jesus said. So therefore, it's different. The, the, it's, it's not an entity. The, the rhema is what he said. Yes. The logos is who he is. Yes. You know, he is the logos. He speaks the rhema. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the difference. But since they're both translated word, it's easy to kind of blend them and confuse them. Um, but that's the only time it's used here, so don't worry about it. <laughs> you know, we're going to be focused on something else. And, and what do they do, these, these people that have this, that have been given to, that he's given to them the word, what, what do they do and what do they know? They, they accepted them. Okay, they, they, they believe that he came from God. Yes, they've accepted him, they believe he came from God. And I think when you look at that verse, chap, in verse 8, that for John is the core faith. The core faith is receiving, knowing the, in the truth, which is Jesus, and believing that the Father sent him. Mm -hmm. That, for John, is the key to faith. It's believing that Jesus is who he says he was. Well, says he is. that faith in everything? Well, for Paul, Paul's going to use a little different nuance of faith, because for Paul, it's going to be more like trust. Uh, this is, John is, is, kind of gets his toes on knowledge. Now, the two aren't contradictory. You know, they're complementary. But John is going to be more believing that. Because you know that. This yes, yes. Believing that, which leads to trust. Paul is going to be more, faith is because trusting in. Trust. Exactly, exactly. And, and so it's not contradictory. It's just a different focus. Slightly different focus. Uh, okay, so this... But he's, you can't trust if you don't believe. Well, that's right. Well, we, we don't... That's right. 
You don't, unless you know certain things you can't trust. But if you don't trust, the knowledge means nothing. Right. You know, so the two have to be together. Again, it's, a, it's a sa the same thing that we just discussed. If you don't accept it and believe it, Doesn't mean anything. then it has yeah. good value to it. And, that's what, and I'll tell you, guys, that's why John can say the judgment of the world has occurred right now. Because, because the judgment right of the now. world is, if you don't believe, none of this stuff means anything. You know, it doesn't have to be fire, pitchforks being poked at you, smell of sulfur. You don't need that. If you don't believe, you, you, don't, don't, you don't know God. And, and you don't know God's presence, and you don't know God's protection, and you don't know that Jesus reveals God. You, you don't know that because you've chosen not to trust Him or, or to, to believe this. Uh, so, and that's the judgment. You're separated. If eternal life is relationship with God, if I don't believe in God, then I don't have a relationship with, with him. I mean, duh. Uh, it just... <laughs> just getting her massage for the day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you are so spoiled. You were just so Jeez, he ruined it. Huh? I did. I broke the mood is what I did. Uh, I, I broke the mood. Now, be careful. That dog still has a part of an argyle sock in her stomach. Oh, <laughs> There's still a part of an argyle sock. Not that I've seen it. So, okay. Now, so he's, he's, he's kind of introduced the prayer. I think that's what he does through verse 8. Makes a little shift in the prayer. For whom is he asking? He's asking for us. Okay, he's asking for us. We're praying for that now. Now, uh, why is he not praying? He's praying then for disciples. What? Did everybody hear yes, that? We heard okay, that. good. Um, why is he not praying on behalf of the world? Because he wasn't given the world. He was given the disciples. He was given the disciples, and the world is. Not well, the, yeah, it's in darkness. I mean, he said that in chapter one that the world is in is in darkness. Okay, uh, th therefore, which becomes kind of interesting, what is the only hope for the world? The disciples. To yeah, to be disciples. To, to bring out what Jesus has taught them. And, and therefore... He knows he's going to descend into heaven. Okay. And he's leading the disciples to become teachers of the word. Okay. Therefore... They must come to believe or they have no part. Therefore, they have to cease being the world. the world. They have to stop being the world. The only hope for the world is for the world to stop being, to stop the, world. being the world. Wow, that's kind of profound. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what will soon be the situation for the disciples? What's going to what's going to be the situation the disciples are going to face soon? Verse ten. Jesus. Jesus, Jesus isn't going to be, isn't going to be there, right? Yeah, they're going to be lifted up. They're going to be, he's going to be lifted up. Uh, they're going to be alone. Jesus is going to come to the Father. So what does Jesus ask? For the Father to protect them both. Okay. His name. Protect them in their name. Now, he's already talked a lot about, you know, why they need protection, right? Why, why do they need protection. Because the world's against them. The world's going to be against them. Uh, and, and you're going to be thrown out of synagogues mm -hmm. and you're going to be treated like garbage and it's going to be really, really tough. Now, what does he want, what does he hope the, the Father does for these disciples? They're going to need protection. Mm -hmm. how, how do, what does Jesus ask in terms of the nature of the, the, the protection? Have joy. Okay, that they have joy. What else does he want? What does he want, want them to, to become that's going to give them protection in this hostile world? United what? with God. United. United with God and united with? Each other. With each other. With, with, with each other. You, know, if, you have to have a common goal or you don't have unity. Absolutely. And so you've got to have both. You've got to have the unity with God and you need unity with one another. One another. Now what then is he, t what is John telling this later church? You got to be, unified. you got to be unified. You got to be unified because that's going to give you what? Power. Power and, and protection. protection. It's going to give, that's what's going to give you protection from the world is, is that uni unity. And that's what he asked God to give. Give to him. 
Now, what did Jesus do in the past? He was there to buffer. He was there. He was there to buffer. He was there to do what? To protect him, right? Uh, and was he successful? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. absolutely. Only the one, one that was lost was the one that was destined to be lost. Yes, I love it. He, was he 100% effective? Did he protect his group? Was that protection 100% effective? Yes. Yes, yes it was. He was 100% effective. Well, what about Judas, Judas for crying out loud? Uh, ha, 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 ha. Jesus says, It was destined. It was, Judas was destined. Ooh, that becomes really interesting. Which means for John, Judas had no choice. Had no choice. Judas had no choice but to be lost. 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 But to be Judas. If you've ever seen the musical Jesus Christ Superstar, that's that's how Andrew Lloyd Webber presents Judas. That uh, Judas doesn't know why he does what he why he did what he did, uh, but he knows that. The result and ask God, why did you do this to me? And he because could, yeah, he's, he he's stop. driven. And he couldn't stop. stop. Yeah, he, he couldn't stop it and he didn't control it because God was in, God was in control of it. And and that's a understand that's John's understanding of Judas. That's not what we pick up in the other gospels. You know, it's not that sort of destiny. You know, the devil isn't entering Judas. Satan isn't entering. You know, Judas seems to be a free agent. He, he seems to be able to do what he wants to do. Uh, Don't we all feel that we can do that? Well, I think we, yeah, I think we, we do. Yeah, we we yeah. always feel that we're in control, yeah. but it's always, always God that has the reins. Right, right. But can God, can God send an evil one into it? I mean... If it wouldn't have happened, then what would have happened? Well, that's right. That's, Alice, you're exactly right. And that's what John is saying. John is saying what happened had to happen. And since God, man, and one of the things, if you take nothing else from John, God is in control in John. Do you, if you believe in Jesus, you believe in Jesus because God lets you, God lets you do it. But God doesn't, God doesn't make you do evil, so... Well, but but for here, he did make Judas betray. But it always says God does not make you do evil. Well, if you look at if you look at what Judas, no, you're right, you're good. If you look at what Judas did, and and it's and I would, let me say this, and then I will go back to something Paul wrote in Romans. If if you look at what Judas did, you say, oh, what Judas did is evil, right? I mean, uh, when Dante, Dante when, in Dante's Inferno, at the core of hell, the core of hell is Satan. And, in, and if you've ever seen, it's a, he's pitiful. Satan is pitiful because he's sitting in a block of ice, which, you know, you, it's not fire. He's sitting in a block of ice. And he's perpetually crying. You know, he's perpetually, and in his mouth, he's chewing. <laughs> He's chewing on two, two people, eternally chewing on two people. You know, who's eternally in, in, in Satan's mouth. And he has these huge wings, but he flaps them, but he can't fly. You know, he, he, just, he just perpetually flaps these wings as he sits in his block of ice, crying, <laughs> chewing, kind of a pathetic figure. This yeah. is how he portrays Satan, not as a powerful but, but as sort of a pathetic figure. And he's chewing on Judas and Brutus. Judas and Brutus. The one who assassinates Julius Caesar. Mm -hmm. is, is, is eternally being chewed in the mouth of Satan and undergoing this. Uh, that's, that's how he's portrayed. What, what you could say, if you look at this, is... The fact that Jesus is going to be lifted up on a cross, glorified, right? And as a result of the glorification, what's going to happen to the followers of Jesus later? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. They're going to receive Holy Spirit. And the world is going to change because this good news is going to be announced. Is that a bad thing? No. 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 If Jesus hadn't been lifted up, it would be a bad thing. that wouldn't have happened. And therefore, that was eternally in the mind of God eternally in the mind of God. So as what I'm saying is you're right. What 
you're right, God does not, does, wouldn't cause him to do something evil. Therefore, what he did was, God. was, was God necessary was God for good. And Paul will say the same thing in the 11th chapter, uh, 9th chapter of Romans. Because the issue in Romans is going to be, what is God going to do with the Jews? You know, Roman is a Gentile church, all of a sudden has, Jews are coming back to Rome, so Jews are entering this church. Jewish Christians are entering the church. Gentiles don't want them there, because Gentiles believe the Jews rejected Jesus and have no place in the church. They don't belong here. They rejected him. The Jews don't like the Gentiles because they're Gentiles, they're Gentiles <laughs> and we all know Jews are better than Gentiles, yes. right? And they don't know their place. So you got a church that's got problems in, in the Roman church that didn't have problems when the Jews had been exiled from the city of Rome, but now Nero has invited them back, and so you get Jews that are Jewish Christians that are coming back into the church. And so this Gentile, predominantly Gentile church, is struggling with what do we do with Jews? And more and on a higher level, how does God deal with Jews? Because God sent Jesus, right, that the Jews whom the Jews rejected. rejected. And if relationship with God is through Jesus, Jesus and the Jews don't rejected it, therefore, they, reject they can't have a relationship with God. They don't have a relationship with God. That's, that's the issue. But if they don't have a relationship with God, that means... They're not Christian. Well, they, and they are Christians. They're Jews. They're Jews. But that would mean if they no longer have a relationship with God, what's the implications of that? You say, oh, that's fine. That's it. You know, dispensationalism. My gosh, you still hear about that. That they're too different. God made this deal with the Jews, didn't work out so well, made a new deal through Jesus Christ. Two dispensations. Every now and then you hear that. Uh, Paul deal, that's what he's dealing with. If God all of a sudden decided, it didn't work out with my people. So I sent Jesus, and this is new. Then all the promises God made to his people are void. Are void. Which means, what about God? He, he, not not faithful. he can change his mind. He's not, He's not faithful. And it, it, the minute I say, and this is what Paul is dealing with, the minute we say that God, then the Jews are no longer God's people because they rejected no, Jesus. The minute we say that, then, and they're lost, and they're damned, and yada, yada, yada. The minute we say that, then God changes his mind and isn't faithful. So but what do we do? But the Jews have rejected Jesus. But through John, we learn that if they believe in Jesus, if, you know, as uh -huh. Jewish people begin to believe in Jesus, mm -hmm. they become part of the unit. True, right. And so therefore, Jews... Jewish isn't their identity anymore. Well, their identity is God. Paul, what Paul, Paul goes at, that's sort of what he said. Because what Paul will say is, and again, this speaks to what we're talking about here, where we say, what did Judas do? Did Judas do something horribly evil? Well, if you read Matthew, Mark, and Luke, yeah, he kind of did. Uh, but if you read John, there's this little nuance. Judas was destined to do that. This is kind of what Paul says in the ninth chapter of Rome. Not with Judas, but with somebody, with other people. He says that God is in, he, his premise is God is in control. And he says, understand, sometimes God's control doesn't make sense to us. Uh, sometimes it doesn't make sense. Let me give you, Paul says, let me give you two examples. Let's look at Abraham, right? Mm -hmm. Father of the Jewish people. Let's look at Abraham. Abraham had one son, right? And he was supposed to kill him. He had one son? No. No, he didn't have one son. How many sons did he have? Two. Well, actually he had, a, he had a whole bunch of them. <laughs> he had them later. Had, you know, later. But at the beginning, he had Ishmael. Ishmael. And Isaac. Okay, two sons. So the promise must have gone through both of them. No. So the children of Ishmael and the children of Isaac are the same. No. The promise went through Isaac, Isaac right? So God chose, said the descendants of Abraham would be my people. Abraham has two sons, but the promise goes through one and not the other. Well, that sounds... Unfair. unfair to me, right? 
Well, it's because Sarah, Sarah and Hagar. Hagar was an Egyptian slave. Sarah was a good Jewish girl. Makes sense. Okay, let's look at another example. Isaac has two sons. Two sons. What are the two sons of Isaac? Esau and Jacob. Okay, you got Esau and Jacob. Now, same mother? Yes. Yes, Rebecca's the same mother. Two sons, same mother. mother. But the youngest one inherits. Well, oh. because the younger... The, the younger well, one... But they were, they were twins, weren't they? They were twins. They were twins. You have twin boys, but God decided that the younger one, the promise would go through the younger. Not fair. And, and Paul goes even further. He says, without knowing anything, irregardless of their life after. And if you read the story, Jacob is a... Bad dude. Yeah, he's a piece of work. Esau is a heck of a lot better ethically than Jacob. Jacob, he, the name means cheat. That's what it means in Hebrew. Imagine naming your little boy cheat. You know, you're kinda, but that's what he is, surplanter. That's what he does. Jacob is, a, is, is not a good person. Yet the promise goes through. Jacob, what is that, Shelley? What does that sound like to you? Unfair. Unfair. And Paul says, is that unfair? He says, he says, no, it's not unfair. Because God's intention is always, always, always. The best. Mercy and compassion. Always mercy and compassion. He doesn't say mercy and damnation. He says mercy and compassion. And it's the promise flowing through Isaac and flowing through Jacob. He talks about hardening Pharaoh's heart. Why did he harden Pharaoh's heart? Because it had to happen the because way it did. Because it had to happen the way it did. And the promise flows. Therefore, God is, his intention is grace and mercy. And that's what John is saying. He's saying, it's a long way around it. That's what he's saying about Judas. The fact that Judas did what he did led to grace and mercy, grace and mercy to whom? To us. To us, including any descendants of Judas. Now, it does you think that sort of a, in a way, sort of similar between, uh, uh, who were we just saying? Jacob, well, we no, said no, no, a lot no, of no. <coughs> no, the one who betrayed Jesus. Oh. Judas. Judas. Okay. Judas and Job. In, yeah. Uh, in, yeah, in the respect that, you know, Job had no control over right, what was Right, right, right. Good, yeah. good analogy, shall we? Yeah, yeah that, you're right. That's exactly right. That neither one, at least how he's presented in John. Yeah. Judas could not be anything other than what Judas was. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and remember, John, in John, he's stealing from the money. So he was a good guy. No. You know, but the betrayal was destined. He was destined to do it. Also means that Jesus didn't miss. You know, he got 11 of them right, but really blew it on one. No, you know, he didn't. He, he, didn't. Well, he knew what, was, <laughs> what he was doing. Okay, so we've got, we've got that, that, I think that's relatively important because what we're talking about is God's control. Mm -hmm. And that God's control is always, as Paul says, mercy and compassion <coughs> all the time. Now, does it look like that to you all the time? No. no. Oh, no. Like, duh, of course it doesn't. You know, but our perspective is physical, is physical and limited. Mm -hmm. You know, we're limited by time. God is eternal. eternal. So it's interesting that Matthew, Mark, and Luke deal with physical things way more than John. Absolutely. And John Absolutely. deals with the same things, but on a spiritual level, Absolutely. which are so far beyond how we, we comprehend things. I, great point. And you know, when you, the re, I think the reason it, they, he, they do that, the three and then the one, is that one of the things that's really important in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, particularly in Mark and Matthew, is Jesus identifying with us. That Jesus identifies with us. I think and, that allows and, us to identify closer to Him. Also absolutely, absolutely. Because He, he did things that I would do with that. Uh, absolutely. Right? John, uh, not so much. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, the, exactly. There is no if if somebody if anybody in this room says, "Well, I can sure identify with the Jesus in John," mm -hmm. Lord have mercy. <laughs> 
you know, either you need to see a psychiatrist or we need to be worshiping you because we're not supposed to identify with Jesus in John. We're I think supposed to see who he really is. Exactly. I think in the other gospel, particularly in Mark, I think that identification is really, really crucial that we do identify. And he, the writer of Hebrews tells us why. Because Jesus, when on the Father, can identify with us. So all our weaknesses is brought, are brought into God. Uh, if Jesus couldn't, then, then they would Well, wouldn't. I think the ones in Hebrews, the thing I find encouraging about that is when you look at the lives of the people they're talking about, they lived their lives just like we did, with mess-ups and mm -hmm. screw-ups and downright nastiness, and then got, they're still waiting for the promise the same as we are. Mm -hmm. it, it didn't disqualify them. What, what Paul is going to end up saying in the 11th chapter of Romans, and that's the key, to me that's the key chapter in Romans, not chapter 8, but chapter 11 is the key, is that what Paul will say is the reason the Jews rejected, this is all part of God. Mm -hmm. The Jews rejected because that was God's will. Mm -hmm. The Jews rejected because the Gentiles needed to come in. Mm -hmm. And he uses the analogy of an olive tree. Mm -hmm. The, the, the cultivated branches. branches were cut off so the wild branches could be grafted in. Now that's a shot at Gentiles. Because he's, you know, the Gentiles are the wild branches. But Paul says, but don't worry about the cultivated branches. Because if we could do the wild ones, think how we could well, do and the even, cultivated ones would regraft. He even says, once all the wild branches are, are grafted in, then the cultivated branches are going to be put back in. And there'll be one, one olive unit. tree, and we're all going to be together. And at the very end, he says, you don't understand this, do you? Well, you know something? Praise to the grace and glory and majesty of God. How unsearchable are your ways? Because it's not what we would do, but it's what God did. And, and that's, that's the God that's in control. That's the God we see presented here. And, and as he con concludes his prayer, so he's asking that, that God protect him. As he concludes the prayer in verse 20, for whom else does he pray? Those that believe the message that they tell, the okay. disciples tell, that's us. That's us. So not only is he praying for his disciples, he's praying for later believers who just happen to be us and John's audience, those who are hearing the gospel. And he says, if you want, telling his disciples, if you want protection, you need to come together. What does he say about disciples later? What, what is he asking God to and help the disciples do that? To complete unity, to let the world know that you well, sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. So he's asking, asking that they be unified. And what's going to be the focus of their unity? Okay. It's going to be love and it's going to be raising. raising. It's going to be God, right? God. The focus is going to be on faith. It's going to be faith in God loving one another. And it's still, and, still with all the stuff he's teaching and, and going out, God still doesn't, you, you still doesn't want you to know everything he's doing. You just have to believe and trust. You trust. That, that what's going on is what... That's exactly right. You don't... I, I, I remember there, I think I told you once before, there was a guy in a church, my church in Indianapolis, and he was very, he was, a, he was an incredible man. Just unbelievable. He had uh, cerebral palsy, and, but he did remarkable things. And I remember we had a lot of discussions uh, because he was very interested in Bible and stuff. And one of the discussions we had was about faith and knowledge. And, and I said, you know, Jesus tells us to have faith, and, and faith isn't the same as knowledge. And he says, oh, no, 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 you got to know. You, you got to know. It's all about knowledge. You got to know. And, and I said, no, you got to trust. In fact, if you know, you don't need to trust. And Jesus tells us to trust. To trust. And, and that's kind of what you're saying, and I think that's what he's saying too. Mm -hmm. You know, you trust that it's God bringing us together. It's trust that we belong to God. It's trust that we can see the Father when we look at Jesus. the Son, at Jesus that we can get that through the words that we're taught, that we understand those words because of what? 
spirit, the spirit that was given to us, all of that is trust. And it's, it's making that decision to, to trust. Knowledge isn't a decision. I don't decide to know. No, I just do. I just do. Yeah. Dis- trust is always, <laughs> trust is always, always, always a decision. Uh, there was a great theologian that compared it, uh, faith to walking in a dark room, a pitch black room. You step through the door, trusting that there's a floor on the other side. But you don't know it. You, you don't know it, but you trust it. Now, it's based on knowledge. You've gone through thousands of doors and thousands of times there have been floors there. So it's not like you're completely ignorant and you have no clue at all. It's an elevator shaft. It's not, you know, you, you have reason for trust, but it still comes down. Do, you, do, you believe do, do I there? trust yeah. that it's there? And, and that's, what it's, that's what Jesus is saying. Shelly, you're exactly right. That's what he's asking. God to enable the people to do and that trust comes as we're together and we we share what God has given to us. Question. If we are to be unified and the Father and Jesus are one then and if we're one with God why aren't we one with each other? Good question. I'm just saying is, you know, our mindset has to become less internal and more inclusive. Yeah, boy. I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> I think you're I think you're exact and that's what he's praying. I think that's yeah. what he's praying. You know, that was one of the reasons that I like to infiltrate <laughs> is to, because you can't be one with me if you don't know me. Mm-hmm. And I can't be one with you all if I don't know you. Mm-hmm. And while we may not believe all the same things, we are unified in our core beliefs. Mm-hmm. And if you look at Jesus and you see God, then why don't we see God when they, we see each other? But I, te- I, I made a remark once, which I think is really true. Some people who, who never know see you. If they see you, like the Bible, they never read the Bible, don't know anything about it, but if they can see it in you, that makes a difference. It does you might be the only Bible they ever, mm-hmm. you know. Sadly, um, I, th- I think what ends up happening within and that's the saddest part. It's within the community that we start, we, we stop seeing, we look for our differences. Look for our difference rather than our commonality. I told a man, I was talking to a man on um, Saturday night who comes from a Roman Catholic background. And we, he was talking about the differences and yada, yada, yada. And I said, you know, one of, the, one of the things I feel that really makes me sad, really makes me sad, is that we probably agree on 95%. Absolutely. 95. And, and what's most important is that we trust, we trust in Jesus Christ. Now, how that trust is expressed is different. You know, it may be extra, expressed through a, a Pentecostal experience of tongues. It may be expressed through following the, the, the sacraments. It may be expressed so intellectually, through study, you know, it could be expressed a lot of ways, but it's still the fundamental, we, we trust in God. How we express it may be different, we trust in God. And, and that should be, and, and we trust in God because that's what God wants us to do. That should be the source of unity. And it, does, that doesn't, it doesn't matter how much water you use in baptism. It doesn't matter whether you use wafers, or bread cubes or loaves. Uh, it, 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 that, it, just, it doesn't matter whether you view marriage as a sacrament or, or not. That's not important. Uh, I'm, saying, I'm not saying it's unimportant, but it's not, it's not important. The, thing, the, the thing that unifies us is, is trust. And that's where we need to be putting our, our focus. Uh, and in fact, maybe 
if I, if I choose to make that the focus, I may, I may experience some of what a person who has Pentecostal experiences. Maybe I can, I may never do that myself. That may never be the way I relate to God. Maybe I can understand a little bit why they do. Maybe I can understand a little bit the, the orthodox mysticism, you know, in a service that I can't even understand the language because the language is a language I don't understand. But maybe I can appreciate, you know, the, the reverence and, and the mystical awe that's in those services. Maybe I can appreciate in a brethren service, getting on my daggone knees and washing somebody's feet, something that may never move me, but maybe I can appreciate the kind of dedication and the willingness to be humble that's expressed there because we share a common trust in God. We can actually grow from one another if we allow ourselves to do it instead of pointing out the differences and even worse, trying to convert one another. I think one of the things that helps me is to realize that different isn't wrong, necessarily. Mm -mm. Different is just different. And because I'm different from anybody in this room, I'm going to do things differently. And you're going to do things differently. And it's where you have to stop judging and then be accepting of differences. It, 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 I, I think so. Uh, I, I believe. And I think that's, that's kind of where he's, that's the kind of unity he's talking about. And I think that's what Paul wants his church in Rome to see as they relate to the Jews. You know, instead of judging them, you know, because it's a Gentile church, trust in God. I had a, and, and then I'll, we'll, we'll, well close with prayer. Do you, do you often, well, when you start questioning somebody else's belief, you take on the will of God. He said, what you're believing is definitely wrong, but what I believe is definitely right, so therefore I'm closer to God than you're closer to God. And you, know, you have that mindset rather than we're equal with God. And not, I, excuse me, I don't think no, 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 but we're, yeah. we're, we're, we we're, we're shared. Yeah, we're we're, yeah. we're the, on the same level yeah. as we approach God, I and guess is a better word. In, in Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, his, his thesis is, I want to go to Rome because I've never been there and I want to share with you the gospel. That's, that's the thesis of Rome, the letter to the Romans. And so what Paul needs to do is to establish that they need to hear it. And Paul is a plotter. He is a plotter. He makes every point three or four times. So, he, I mean, there's no uncrossed T's when you read Paul. Anyway, he wants to establish that he needs to go. They, there's a reason he needs to go to Rome. And he they starts, well, and, well first he, what he's going to say is everybody is a sinner, that sin is a problem. And Paul puts at the center of sin idolatry, worshiping the creature rather than the creator. In the first chapter of Romans, that's what he puts as the core of sin, worshiping the creature rather than the creator. In the background, remember, it's talking about Gentiles and Jews. He starts, says everybody needs to hear the gospel. He starts by saying, well, let me tell you one group that needs to hear the gospel. It's the pagans who are running around worshiping sticks and bushes and trees and stuff. Man, they are screwed up. Mm -hmm. And they need to hear the gospel, right? And it has screwed up their relationship with God. It screwed up their relationship with nature. It screwed up their relationship with one another. And that's what he says. If you read the first chapter of Romans, that's what he says. And I can, because Paul's really good at how he writes, and I can imagine this is being read out loud. He envisions the church, this I Gentile church that. going, tell it, you know, we need more preachers like Paul. You know, telling those pagans, you know, just how rotten they are. That's what we need. That's what we need. And then in the second chapter, Paul says, whoa, wait a minute. When you judge those pagans, you are assuming a position that belongs to God. to God. Therefore, you're committing idolatry too because you're worshiping yourself and you are a creature. Mm -hmm. So you have set yourself up as God, which makes you just as bad as the guy's worshiping statues. 
And then the few people in that congregation who are Jews are saying, yeah, Paul, way to tell those Gentiles. You're right. They're not one of God's people. Then Paul says, wait a minute. The Jews. You Jews worship the law, which is kind of interesting that he said, because the inference then is the law is has been written by, this is a human view of the law. This isn't, you know, God's word to my, you know, God's mouth to my ear. You know, you worship the law and you, we know we you worship it because you got this wonderful law in front of you and you say, oh, we're God's people because we have the law and all oh, that makes us so special. But you know what you don't do with the law? Live it. You don't live it. Because if you lived it, you'd be loving one another and you're not doing it. So you got it, but you don't live it. And if you think you're so special because you got it, that means the law has become what for you? An idol. And so who worships idols? The pagans were running around acting crazy. Gentile Christians and Jews. Christians or not. So who needs to hear the gospel? Everybody. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes. That's Paul in chapter 3. You know, so he says everybody. And, and that's, you know, everybody needs, needs to hear this. So we're still, but we still... Because we're screwed up, we do that. We tend to yeah, do. Well, because we're human. Yeah, because we're. We, we, I, always, we always attack a problem human. Sure. Us. And we look for divisions. We look to ourselves, yeah. and we assume we know. Well, there, it's so. like different groups, sort of like, like say, I don't know, Indians, In, American Indians, for instance. At least the way they're portrayed, they don't say yeah, God the way we do. They'll say, well, they do. They say Father God, and then mm -hmm. they'll say Mother Earth. I mean, they're, they're, they're. Their belief is in God. They just mm -hmm. express it differently. The, um, maybe if Christians spent less time judging yes. and more time living, I think we, should uh, I think we probably should. Yeah. The word. More living yeah, and loving. Living, you, know, you know, judge yourself by the word, but let them you know, have the freedom to see the law the way they see it mm -hmm. and be able to live it their way. Because... We're not yellow pencils. And so what I value as important in the book, someone else values something else. And so if you compare apples to oranges, you never come out with the right answer. I think we need to listen. Listen and talk oh, yeah. and, and be willing to change. And if we listen and talk and be willing to change, I think we'll be in good shape. And, and just plain love one another as we do love. Man, I think we're in good shape. Well, the thing of it is, the whole process that we're going through is a change of our hearts. Absolutely. Absolutely. So you can't think that your heart is right if it has to change. And I'll tell you, and then I will we'll have a prayer. If God looks down on me on judgment day, and I've already told you, if you're behind me in line, I will be wearing comfortable shoes. Because <laughs> God's going to be with me for a while. He's got a lot of things to tell me on judgment day. Because uh, I think God holds us accountable for what we've done and undone. I don't think Christianity gives us a, a free, pass. free pass of accountability. I think I'm going to hear, you know, God's going to tell me what I need to hear. And it's going to be a lot. Are and, gonna go so over bring a lunch. Yeah. I, you wonder when you go, when you come to, in front of God, all the stuff that you've already been forgiven, is that still going to be brought up? I think we're held accountable for, for what everything. we've done and not. Now, the difference that Christians have, and I think this is a fundamental difference, and this is based on all the scripture, is as we hear that, we, we trust that at the end of that conversation, God says, Jesus' blood covered your sins. That's right. And you are in. Yeah, I love you. You know, I just can't help but loving you. Mm -hmm. So, and that's going to be the difference. But I don't think we're held, I don't think we're we get a free pass. Mm -hmm. I, I hope I don't. I think I, I want to be held. I want God to hold me accountable. I don't want him, me to, him to burn me, you know, <laughs> but I, I'd like to be, but I, I, you know. But uh, I think accountability and judging are two separate things. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, well, we I think are accountable out. for what we're doing, but our sentence has already been decreed as saved. Yeah, right, right. We will be safe. We well, will most be Most of the time, if you know you've done wrong, you hold that in your heart and you're criticizing yourself all the sure, time. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. The, um, I, I guess what I, what I was going to say is, if at that time God looks down on me and says, Rudiger, you realize 
you got about 40% of it right. <laughs> you got about 40% of it right. Uh, another 40% was in the neighborhood, and 20%, I don't know where you got that stuff. I have no idea where you got it. At the end, though, he's going to say, but my gosh, I can't help but love you. Uh, and so it's not, uh, it, it's not based on how right we are, that one group is right and the others are wrong. It's just, it's based on our trust in God, God and the is, assurance that God is going to love us. God's us. love is so weird. I mean, look at our children. We love our children. Yeah. You know, unconditionally. You'll do anything for yeah. your children or whatever. Magnify that by... Infinite. Yes. Yeah. Infinite. There was a little, I saw this on Facebook the other day. It said, God isn't asking you to figure it out. He's asking you to trust that he already has. Amen. Yeah. That's exactly right. That God is, God is in control and that our destinies are in his hands. And you know what? I'm not going to worry about it. What I will worry about is what I do tomorrow. Yeah. What I will worry about is how I, well, not worry, but what I will think about is how I treat my wife later this evening. If you, you know, that's what I need to think about. Logs, you have well. yeah. yeah, that's right. That's right. I'm still going to screw up because I'm going to say something stupid to her. <laughs> and she's going to get upset. Mm -hmm. But be that as it may, I think what, uh, uh, Dan was telling me about Tom letting Trista come in first after 100 miles. <laughs> I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> that's really good. <laughs> I think that's good. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time together and, and help us simply trust that you're in charge. We may not understand what's going on. Uh, you know, that's okay. We may try. That's okay too. Uh, but fundamentally, help us trust that you do understand and it's all part of your will and, and that we're going to be okay because you hold our futures, our destinies in your hands. Assure us of that in the name of Christ. Amen. Amen. Okay, next week we're going to have a big shift because we're going to start, the ball's going to start rolling to crucifixion in chapter 18. When do you want to do that Paul, uh, Paul's letter? You said? Well, I think maybe after we finish John, uh, although we could do something else, or you could do, you to choose to do something else yourself. That would be fine with me. I mean, whatever you want to do is, is good. I was thinking... I'm here and I want to look at Romans and I get it. I, I would like to... I'll tell you, if we could look at Romans, I mean, that wouldn't be bad. Romans is sort of the definitive book. Either Romans or Galatians. Well, Philippians is good. Well, they're all good. They're all good. Well, it's all good. Some are better than others. You know, Corinthians, the Corinthian letters. Uh, you know. Well, that's the way they talk about us. Yeah, but it's they're they're just running amok in court. 